sick for 12 years, had an issue of blood. She was sick. She dealt with that issue so that when she touched God, she would be healed and God would get the glory. There was a man who was laid by the pool of Bethesda all of his life. About 40 years he laid there just so that God could get the glory out of his life by letting something fabulous happen. And nothing fabulous happens if there's no hard times. You can't appreciate the sunshine without the rain or the snow here in Colorado. God allows things to happen in our lives. He allows us to walk. God said that he would always be with us, but he never said we wouldn't go through any trouble. And that's why David could say in Psalms 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? Because my God is with me. This is the God that we're talking about. He said he would never leave us, and he said he would never forsake us, and guess what? He meant it. Not only did he mean it, he means it. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So for Joseph, this is a very pivotal moment in his life, because up until, uh, until now, we've only known Joseph to be a dreamer with good work ethic, <laughs> right? He was a dreamer. He had good work ethic. But the text reveals how God uses setbacks in good times in order to set us up for great ones. Man, this was a shout church. I think somebody would have jumped up and ran around or something like that. But he uses setbacks in good times to set us up for great times. So while in prison, Joseph is attending to uh, the king's cupbearer. You guys know this story? You see the cartoon, uh, The Prince of Egypt? If not watching, it's pretty accurate, but it's not exactly accurate. Anyway, so he's, he, you know, he's attending uh, to the king's cupbearer and the, and, and the chief baker who have been in custody for some time at this point. And each of them have a dream. And Joseph uh, tells them in Genesis chapter 40 that interpretations belong to God. So he says to him, he says, you know what? Tell me your dream. So, so Joseph here, he's giving glory to God, right? He's giving the glory to God. He's saying, look, I don't interpret dreams. The interpretations belong to God. And because I have this relationship with God, God kind of reveals to me some stuff sometimes. So, so tell me your dreams. And they share their dream. And Joseph, in turn, tells them what their dreams mean. And there comes a time in our life, so here's what I'm getting at. There comes a time in our life when, 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 when people need help understanding their dream. There comes a time when God will, will show us people who, who, who they have a dream, they just don't know what is required to make the dream a reality. And so God bumps us into people, he, he, he puts us in their path because God is trying to show us that there comes a time in our life when our gifts, our talents are not just for us. God allows us to experience situations where he takes our talents and he goes, you know what, uh, I don't want you being the only one benefiting from this talent. I don't want you being the only one getting the good stuff that's coming from this talent. So, so he's going to put some things in our life, some people in our life uh, that will cause us to use our talent not just for our own good, but for their benefit. You got to believe that God can use you in that way, that God can use you to make somebody else's life better. So uh, we progress in our talents where we're no longer the benefactor of the gift, right? And, and, and God gives us at least, I told you earlier, he gives us at least one talent, at least one, that can be used to bless somebody else. So here's what I want you to do just once again, just turn to your neighbor and ask them, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> Go ahead and ask him. Ask him, what have you done for me lately? How has your gift, how has your talent been a blessing to somebody other than you? That's the point here. How has your gift, how has your talent, your abilities, how have they been a blessing to somebody else's life other than your own? It's apparent to me that Joseph understands that his talent is a seed. Your talent is a seed. Your talent is is a seed. Your talent is a seed. He is wise enough then to take his talent, which is a seed, and use it in a way that benefits somebody else, but it, it will return to him later in the future. I'm going to show that to you in a second here. So they tell Joseph their dreams, and he tells them what it means, and in and, and Genesis chapter 40, turn there, in Genesis chapter 40, verse 14, he says this. He says, but when all goes well with you, because he told them what their dream meant, he told them what was going to happen from their dream. Genesis chapter 40, verse 14, he says, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Right? 
And then he says, hey, put in a good word for me. You know, if my boss calls you, will you be a good reference for me? You know, uh, he says, uh, mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Some of us feel like that we're trapped in a, in a prison, right? We, we, find, we can't seem to find a way out of our situation, right? We can't seem to find a way out of our trouble. We can't seem to get the promotion on the job. Here's what I'm trying to help you to understand. If you use your talents and your gifts to bless somebody else, the Bible says this, give and it shall be given back to you. Now, oftentimes we only want to use the scripture when we're taking up an offering, but it's a principle. It's a universal principle. Give and it shall be given back unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Out of your cup shall men give, not God, men will give into your bosom so much that you can't even handle it. And then he says in Malachi, try me on this and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't even have room enough to receive. Can you imagine what it'd be like to live a life that's so blessed that you're like, I don't even know what to do with this. My wife and I, when we were living in England, you know, we've always been tithers. We've always been givers in the church. And while we were living in England, God was blessing us so much financially. I was like, I don't know what to do with all this money. You know, we would go on trips. We, I remember we took a trip to Spain, four days, five-star hotel, ate at five-star restaurants in Spain. And then when we got back, our credit card was in charge. I contacted the company and I was like, hey, uh, something's wrong here. No money has come out. And they said, oh, no, it shows here that you're paid in full. You're good to go. I waited two weeks later and I said, listen, my wife has done the books. The money has not been taken out of our account. And they were like, we show you're paid in full. You're good to go. So I wrote a letter. Have you ever been so blessed that you tried to force people to take your stuff? <laughs> so I wrote a letter. I said, I want to get this in writing. I don't want this to come back at me later. I don't want somebody to try to say that we, we stole something, you know? And, and I wrote a letter. I said, listen, we charged this. Account. We went and had a vacation, had a great time. But you guys have not taken this money out of our account. I need it gone. Mr. Sturdivant, we see that this is the third time that you contacted us. Please stop. Your trip is paid and pressed down, shaken together, running over. Somebody paid for our trip. I don't know who it was, but bless God. <laughs> you know, and, and so that's what I believe that God wants to do to us. He wants us to understand that our gifts are not just for us. And I believe that once we understand this and once we begin to, we begin to flow in this more generously with our talent, we, it's, it's, we will start better understanding the return on investment. See, because we don't understand the return on investments, we don't invest. Because we're afraid that if I give, it's not going to come back to me. I'm not talking about your money, we'll talk about that next week. I'm talking about your gifts. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about just taking a moment to pour into somebody else's life and watch the return on investment. When, when you mentor somebody so that they go from here to here and you pour into them and then they get to this level and then they get great. Here's, here's what your vision should be for the people that are in your life that you're trying to bring up. You take what they know and then you pour into them everything that you know and by the time you put those two things together, they should be on a greater level than you were so that the day will come that they can bless you for being a blessing to them. I'm telling you, there's a return on investment when you pour into people's life. So here's what we're gonna look at. Uh, there's a time, there's a time that you have to understand. There's a time between seed time and harvest time. People won't always, right away, pour back into you. Just like if you go out right now and you plant an apple tree, tomorrow, you're, I mean, uh, plant an apple seed, tomorrow you're not gonna have an apple tree. You've got to give it time to come back to you, right? So here, Genesis 40, verse 23, it says this, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. <laughs> he forgot. The last thing I said to you going out the door is, look, just remember me. Put in a good reference for me. And he forgets him. And this will make some of us, you know, curse the day that we met that person that we blessed. It will make us, uh, some of us, you know, hate them for the rest of our life and hold offense to us. You know, that family person that you helped out for all, the, for all that time, every time they needed money, every time they needed help, you were there for them. And now all of a sudden, they don't remember those moments that you were there. They don't remember the moments that you encouraged them. They don't remember the moments that you helped them out. They don't remember none of that. The person that you loaned money to. 
And now that you need money, they're nowhere to be found. Those kind of, I guess I thought I was going to teach, but I guess I'm preaching a little bit here. Uh, but here's what I'm saying. Instead of taking it out on them, instead of trying to get your revenge for them, for, for them having selective memory, we need to be patient and let God remind them of the time that you were there in the lowest points of their life. Let God remind them of the time that you were there praying for them when they felt like giving up. Let God remind them of the times when they were in their darkest moments and you pulled them out of the pit. You blessed them. You use your talents, your treasures, your gift to help them when they are hopeless and in despair. The Bible says that two whole years passed by before the cupbearer remembered Joseph. Two years. <clears throat> two, how do you forgive me for two years? So, two years. But when the cupbearer actually did remember Joseph, it changed not only Joseph's life, but the entire known world to them. Genesis chapter 41, verse 8, it says this. Beginning in verse 8, it says, in the morning, this is Pharaoh. So Pharaoh is being plagued by this reoccurring dream, right? He's, it's really more like a nightmare, something you would think came out of a Tim Bergen movie. It's weird. He has this dream. Read it. You, you can read it in the first uh, couple of uh, verses of uh, chapter 41, I believe. But in verse 8, it says, In the morning, uh, Pharaoh, his mind was troubled. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. And Pharaoh told them his dreams. But no one, say no one. No one. No one could interpret them for him. Then the scrub chief cupbearer <laughs> said to Pharaoh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Oh, really? Two years later, you're reminded of your shortcomings. Anyway, so he says, I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servant, and he imprisoned me, and the chief baker in the house and the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him of our dreams and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. 